is with my great pleasure to take you from Colombia to Peru. And Andres Vasquez, if we can have you log on. There he is. I am here. Hi, Jill. Hi, Andres. Andres, nice Hi, to see you? you. Nice to see Thank you, you too. Thank you so much for how are you doing? with us today. Oh, we're doing great I'm here in Las Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> Well, enjoy Las Vegas. I mean, it's not the same Vegas now that in the past, but no. enjoy never <laughs> No, it is not. Um, so in, in Peru, Andres is the Peru. president of Can Farm, and we are going to, to, to discuss um, some new market struggles that are happening in Peru. Uh, first, if you could tell us a little bit about your background in the cannabis industry. When did you come into the industry, and, and what was your your reason for joining, that would be fantastic. Totally, totally. It's a kind of a funny story. Uh, well, I am a biologist by education, and um, I used to work in um, around the year 2001 for a pharmaceutical company that wanted to develop a whole line of products, um, an extract from uh, botanicals from, the, from our mountains and the Amazon. And uh, unfortunately, there was no like one prime uh, species that could lead the whole project. So after a lot of research, we had to shut it down. So this is 2001. And in 2017, 16 years later, I, uh, while working as an agribusiness consultant, I happened to you know, learn from the cannabis world and uh, had some uh, Canadian clients come in to us to ask us for advice in order to guide them to where in South America could they develop a cannabis industry. So I was shocked that there is new industry coming into, into our area. And I was very lucky to uh, meet at that time a lady who runs and leads. So she has led a lot of the activism in Peru. Uh, her name is Francesca Brivio. And uh, she invited me to join her in a patient-oriented association which helped me understand uh, the, uh, the reasons and the origin on the regulation. In the case of, of Peru, it's a patient-oriented regulation. So with those two worlds, the business side coming from Canada and the patient side coming from our, 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 these local associations, I was dragged basically into the industry. And uh, as soon as I could, uh, we started developing a, a business project, which in time, became CanFarm, the company I, I'm running today. So that's, that's how I got into the industry. Sharing that, Andres, I just love hearing about everybody's uh, transitions into this industry. I know a few years ago, I could not really have imagined um, my role in this either, but it's just incredible, isn't it? Oh, no. And the transition is incredible and it's kind of funny. My younger kid, who is eight years old, uh, last year, he used to tell all her, his friends in school uh, that his daddy sells cannabis. Well, as a matter of fact, he was telling that his daddy sells marijuana. And so mm. it was kind of funny at school. But now, <laughs> obviously, things have evolved and, and it's a very much accepted uh, product in, in the society. Yes, which is great to hear. And um, that's a perfect transition into... Um, just finding out more from you about what the what the market landscape in Peru is these days, and where where are we now? And can you tell us, you know, how Peru got to where they are today in terms of its Absolutely. cannabis market? Absolutely. So um, I have, I mean, a conflict of sentiments here because um, if you consider that our cannabis medical cannabis law was approved in 2017. Um, and the first sales on the private network just began last September. So it has been a lot of time. It's been a very long process. And yeah. uh, that delay uh, it has been uh, painful uh, for mainly for patients and second for companies uh, and entrepreneurs trying to make a business here, but mainly patients. So it has been a long delay, however, I think, and I still think, and I thought from the very beginning that Peruvian regulation, while being 100% uh, patient-oriented, 
it is a very flexible regulation and it will open uh, several ways of access for the patients and the doctors. Uh, we'll barely beginning. So as I said, private sales started in September. So it's just, we're not even in two months of, of a real market here, but uh, it's gonna be growing. And obviously we have to go through the process that other countries are going, you know, training, education, uh, doctor's acceptance. And uh, because here as other medical markets, we have to go through uh, prescription, medical prescription. And, but I see this very positively, honestly, in, in very, I think in a couple of months, there are already uh, about 10 pharmacies uh, already with product available, in, at, at least in Lima so far. And there is, as far as I know, three companies active already here. And, uh, and again, it's a very flexible regulation. So even though there is a definition around psychoactive and non-psychoactive depending on the THC content, there's no limitation. So a general practitioner, uh, because we don't need neither a specialization of the doctors, a general practitioner can prescribe any formulation of cannabis for any pathological condition. It can be first resource, last resource, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So it's very flexible for the doctors and that will provide a, a very wide access for patients so much easier than so many other countries that we've Absolutely. already heard. Yeah. Um, it, and is the, can you remind us of how the insurance works in Peru and if that is, you know, a role too? Yes, totally. So um, we have two major uh, insurance systems from the public healthcare sector, and then obviously a wide variety of private insurance. But on the public insurance, you have two levels. So is the, I would say the social insurance, which covers anybody, everybody born in Peru, you have access to that. It's called the SIS, CIS. And um, then you have the second level, which is the insurance that is that you have access when you are in a payroll, so when you are working a person. And um, that's the second level. So among the two of them, almost everybody is covered in the country. Plus, you have families that, that want to and have access to can also hire or pay for a, a private insurance. Now, the regulation on cannabis products states that those products can be covered by the insurance. Public is what they can say, and obviously private is an, is an option for those companies. Uh, now, until now, it has not been, uh, I would say, executed. So there's no cannabis products so far that are covered by insurance. Okay, uh, we are really working with the government to have that happen pretty soon. Uh, however, what, what I can say, digamos, in, 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 a, in a recognition for the government is that since December last year, they decided to start the import of uh, cannabis derived products. So they started importing hemp CBD from the US and uh, they were able to put on sale through one pharmacy in Lima. Uh, one product, it was a 5% CBD hemp derived product and uh, at a very subsidized price. Okay, so um, just to the comparison, it's a 10 ml 5% CBD, which uh, if I translate correctly, at uh, the patient, what the patient pays in the store is around not even $20. It's about uh, 17 something like that. So mm -hmm. it's 50 soles. So it's, it's so, probably around 15, 15 So 15, uh, affordable. Sounds oh, like totally. it's affordable. But um, I, they, the government didn't import very much. They ran out really quickly. Isn't that They the ran case? out from the first batch. They, there was a, a, a void at some point. They imported a second lot. Okay. And uh, it seems that there's still product there. But at this moment, there's also other alternatives in the private sector. So people can, the doctors and the patients can decide where to go according to the preferences or the guidance of the doctor. Mm -hmm. And so are there any immediate changes on the horizon um, for legislation in Peru? Or is or have you just gotten to a phase and we have to see how things play out for a while? As far as the information that we got from the government, yes, there are some changes. First, uh, there is um, a possibility, it has been expressed by, by several 
uh, um, safety from the government, there's a possibility there will be a change in the regulation that will um, affect basically the production licenses, okay? Not necessarily the access from for the patients. Uh, we, we have not yet seen the final draft of those modifications, but that's the information that we've got um, so far. And the other thing is that there is a project in the Congress, okay, for uh, self-cultivation and uh, asso association cultivation, you know, the clubs and the associations growing themselves. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of project being discussed in the Congress. Um, and those are I for, for has, smaller groups of people, or is, is that for private growing or for it's, like it's, a, uh, adult well, use? I've, I've read the project and the, the, no, it's not adult use, it's medical use, but it's, it has two chapters in that um, project for law. One is a family that wants to grow themselves directly. And there's a center number of plants that they could be allowing that uh, move forward in the Congress. And there's, there's a chapter for associations where families could get together and grow as a group, but for their own. It's not for sale. It's not commercial growing. It's just for self-use. Mm -hmm. Not for sharing with other people, and et cetera. So, That's yeah. the spirit of that law. Gotcha. All right. So um, that does kind of make me wonder, just I was thinking about my history with Uruguay being the first country to to decriminalize. Can you just tell can you tell us what what was what was the reaction in Peru? Just what was your reaction? What did people think when your neighbor Uruguay did that? Um, so I would say that generally speaking, uh, the reaction at that time was First, as a surprise, okay. At that time, um, if I recall well, Mujica was in the government, mm -hmm. and uh, so a lot of the things that we heard from Uruguay at that time was was a lot of flexibility, a lot of freedom, a very progressive government trying to really to care for the people. So it was surprising, but the reasons that they were presented were, you know, understandable. And uh, and on the other hand. I mean, remember that Peru has a long history of, of uh, I would say, uh, cartels and narco-terrorism, okay? So, so we have a share of history on that. So it was viewed as something that, like, could never happen in Peru, you know? So, I mean, it was very, you like, far away, like, like, like something that was, you know, you see in the movies, but not very close here. Yeah. I was... Uh... I know I threw you a little bit that with that with that question. I was just getting personally curious about that because it's not really that long ago, and yet look at how far we've come in okay. such a short time, right? Um, and so now the conversation is so much more about the pharmaceutical standards and ensuring safety for the patients. And so I'd like to know from you as the leader in your company, how how do you stay in touch with what your patients need? And how do you kind of manage the challenges of leading your company, answering to a board, looking ahead to international um, trade? How do, you, how do you manage that as a leader and stay in touch with the needs of your patients? Well, I will start by the patients. So um, again, as I said, I, I'm very grateful of uh, having met people that are directly involved with the patient's reality. Um, when I just was getting started in the industry. So I think that my, my approach to the industry was not from a financial perspective, was initially from the patients at the same time than the business. So it not, was not separated in time. So uh, that allowed me to be uh, very much understanding what was going on. Remember also that our law was uh, created and was possible because of patients, okay? The, in Peru, what happened, just as a brief sideline is that, yeah, tell us that story. there was a family there was a family that was growing cannabis for their own consumption and they got uh, uh, arrested okay so police got in their houses and, and it, they confiscated everything that they had they were being they had the support of doctors and they had support of a we'll say a professional grower at the time and um, but I mean it was a, like a big case a lot of media and from that experience, Okay, there was a movement that was created, and there was a lot of uh, of people, you know, 
joining that movement and putting pressure on the Congress to go for a law that would allow the patients to have access. Um, as I understand from their original intention, obviously the law was not a, a self a auto cultivation law, it was a law that was built on the healthcare sector. So it was, as, as it is right now, you have to be a pharmaceutical grade company to, to be able to work there. But the origin of our law is the patients. So I have that from the very beginning. And I've been also very lucky to uh, have people in our team that are uh, very professional, very, I would say, related to patients. Our, our medical director, Dr. Max Alzamora, it is, in my humble opinion, the leading MD in Peru. Um, he has been presenting cases uh, uh, out of the country in, in the last months. He's very respected here. So he leads our medical approach and he helps us understand not only what the patients are needing, but what the doctors need in order to work with the patients. And um, so through, through them and, uh, and the association, the patient association, which his name is uh, Cannabis Drops of Hope, is that uh, we try to be very in contact. And we've done some things, kind of crazy things, but I think they're positive. For example, we, at the very beginning, we did a webinar where the people presenting were patients, were not doctors or scientists, no were the patients telling their experience. And um, I learned this from a, from an event, a GCI event in London last year, where there was a, 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 um, a panel of patients telling their experience. And so we tried to do that. And I think that that has also allowed us to be, you know, close to understanding the reality um, and their needs. And um, that's why, for example, when people ask me about the, the project for auto cultivation, we're not against. I mean, if a patient, if a human being has health needs, who am I to forbid that they, you know, have access to health? Um, the government should be, you know, uh, doing what they have to do, doing their job to provide access to health to those people. If they don't, uh, the human being is going to look for ways to be healthy. So I have to respect that. And uh, that's one of the things that we communicate thoroughly through the company. I mean, patients need their health taken care of. They rely on their doctors. And our job is to have products that are the best option for them. If mm -hmm. they don't buy our products, it's because we're not doing our job. It's not the other way around. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of what I do in the company. You know, try to have our team, which is a great team, focused on what is the main important thing. And I believe that if you have everything, everybody's focused, and, and again, I'm fortunate for the people that work with me. We're going to get to our goal. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, keeping that focus on the, on the patient. Totally. Uh, and how does that translate for you when, when you're going out uh, raising capital? Um, what have your experiences been or what are the trends that you're seeing there? Do you, do you feel like it's aligned? With, um, talking to I, I, th I think it is. I think it is a line. However, obviously, the language of each conversation is different. Obviously, when you are talking with investors, you have to be able to show what, I mean, what is the plan and how are you going to be successful in that plan? And obviously, in our case, it is patient-oriented, but the, the language is different. And in our case, uh, we are trying to express our situation. I mean, I try to make it clear the problem that I see is uh, have several layers. One is that everybody is hoping and is expecting that cannabis derivatives are going to be everywhere, you know, in industrial use, medical use, uh, 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 consumer goods. And we expect a lot of that. However, and I, I, I listened to Julian's presentation a while ago, uh, cost of, of the production is very important. It's very important. Uh, so just as, a, just as an analogy, uh, if you go and buy cardioaspirin, you know that small pills, 81 milligrams of aspirin that people tend to use daily in order to keep their uh, blood thin enough, not have uh, any problems, is a widely consumed product, okay? And uh, when you get that product, the retail price of the aspirin contact in that is $3 per gram. Okay, that's how you pay. 
and and the 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 compound, the acetyl salicylic acid, as a wholesale, is about probably ten twenty dollars per kilo as an ingredient. Okay, that's a mass consumption product. That's everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you go a little bit higher, if you if you use insulin, insulin as a ingredient, probably pharma grade insulin. You have something between hundred and two hundred dollars per kilo. Okay, um, stevia, uh, a sweetener that is mm -hmm. everywhere today as an stevia. ingredient, hundred and fifty dollars per kilo, pure. Okay, so unless and until we are able to bring the cannabis ingredients, okay, to those prices, okay, there's not going to be a mass market. So, I mean, we really need to pay attention on that. So if you're really expecting this to be everywhere, okay, then companies should be planning, how are we going to be able to have an ingredient that, for example, has a penetration of the, the aspirin? Well, the answer is there. You have to be able to go really, really, really down on your costs. So 9,000, 10,000 or more, thousand dollars a kilo, uh, it's not gonna get us very mass consumption, so that's that's the one thing on the problem. I mean, we really need to get the cost taken care of. And the other thing that we consider in the beginning is global market is great, and we really everybody dreams of global market. Everybody has big plans of global market. But um, I mean, uh, my partners and I we've had several um, entrepreneurial experiences, and of course, it's good to think big, but we have to act local act small at the beginning so what we're doing we're taking care of our market first we are in peru we're taking care of peruvian market we're making plans for a regional market so we're then moving into brazil we already have a presence in colombia we're going to be moving mexico ecuador argentina the other countries around us and hopefully with our peruvian production which is going to be very competitive in cost and very close to those markets we will be able to develop our business and hopefully, we will be in some future doing very nice sales, maybe into Europe, maybe into Asia. I mean, we like to think big, but act local. So that's basically what we're doing. Uh, that's that's such a such a smart way to approach it. And I'd love to know a little bit more about um, what your thoughts are about the challenges or the opportunities for foreign investors who have their eye on Peru. As you just mentioned, uh, you're well positioned within that regional Latin American market. Um, what what are you seeing from foreign investors and in, when raising capital and talking about that? Um, I mean, I, I'm going to answer from a more global perspective from my time as a consultant. I would think Peru is a great place to invest. Um, Peru has a, a, a very well-established tradition as an agricultural goods exporter. And uh, if you see some of the uh, high-value fresh crops at this moment, some of them, Peru is the leading producer. Uh, you have to check, I don't know, avocados right now, uh, uh, blueberries, uh, um, uh, grapes. I mean, a lot of that is coming to Peru. Mm -hmm. And it's because we know how to handle high-value crops and from an agricultural point of view. Uh, it's a country where foreign investment is, you know, is welcome, is treated as equal. Um, so there's no really uh, barriers of entry for, for foreign companies that want to come here. And uh, if I may uh, add something that is different from my neighboring friendly countries, for example, is that having access to land in Peru it's not complicated. I mean, the, the land market and the land and water, which is important, uh, is fairly open. So you can come here and, and, and buy, you know, acquire land able for farming. It's now difficult. So I think that the, the, the barriers to get in are very low. Nevertheless, uh, cannabis regulation has added some of them, uh, which are real. And you have to go through a pharmaceutical grade entity if you're going to be able to work in cannabis. So, I mean, we had to build uh, our own in our farm. We built a manufacturing facility, which is pharma grade within the farm in order to be able to move through the regulatory process. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's not that's just there for everybody to grab. 
but I mean, the rules are the same for everybody. So foreign money, Peruvian money, no difference. And can you give us an idea of the kind of time frames that um, that people should be expecting? Um, I can tell you on, in our experience. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have two years now. We we still don't have our cultivation license. We expect that very soon. We are very much advanced in the process. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we got our, our import license. So at this moment, we are importing and selling cannabis products uh, from at this moment two countries and uh, should be four in very soon. And um, but again, I mean, if you go for cultivation and production, you need to consider that. I mean, if you're going to build, design, and do everything on your own, uh, between 12 and 18 months uh, is definitely something that you need to count for. Unless, obviously, that you came. Yeah, unless you come from with, with a big check and you acquire somebody, obviously. I mean, that's, that's faster. And, uh, but, I mean, situation and the global market has changed. I don't think that it's going to happen as it happened in Colombia, right? I mean, at that time. It's not 2016, 2017 anymore. So it's taking longer to get the licenses, that that kind of I thing? Mean, I mean, uh, we have been affected by COVID. I mean, mm. probably the license process w would have been faster uh, uh, pre-COVID. Uh, but, I mean, uh, I, obviously, I obviously need to need to put pressure on, on, on my authorities all the time. But I also have to understand that it's new. I mean, this is a new regulation for Peru. I mean, it's, uh, we have to... Let people understand it, being you know at ease, knowing that it is not for all the fears that they think it is for a, a professional company is going to do medical product out of it. And mm -hmm. in our case, obviously, we 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 leverage a little bit on the fact that, for example, this is not the first medical crop that we are dealing with. We 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 grow since 15 years ago. We grow marigold for the production of lutein that goes into ophthalmics products right and so relevant experience of course now we already do that this organic crop which is the same thing that we're going to do on cannabis mm -hmm. uh and, and we've been using that to show the authorities that i mean we are not just um narco guys that are trying to convert ourselves into this i mean it's we are a former company that uh we've been already handling crops for that type of markets and we want to add this one but again we understand it's a it's a process that will take time. Right, right. So I know that we're coming right up against our time. So I wanted to check in with uh, the ladies if there were any questions that came in from the audience that we wanted to touch on. We do, in fact. And I'd like to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Doc Rob Streisfeld, who's a naturopath doctor. He's on the panelist right now. He has his show on cannabis radio called Concierge for Better Living. We're very appreciative to have him in dual roles as a presenter on health topics during Candle World as well as media moderator. So I know Doc Rob has got a question for Andres. Andres, that, thank you, Denise. Um, that was great. I, I loved hearing about the agricultural component. The, you know, this is not, um, some random weird compound. This is something, this is food, this is nutrition, this is from the soil. And when you have a, a great reputation like Peru does, as far as being able to export, um, you know, crops of quality from coffee uh, to quinoa, uh, it's just pretty, it's, it's definitely something that cannabis is, is going to be high quality and, and handled properly. So the questions that I was having or thinking about was, um, as these um, hurdles or barriers start to break down as you start to get your licenses and start to open up the market in Peru, where does uh, research or clinical research stand? Um, you know, because that's an interest of mine personally. It's something that I think when we can back uh, things with science and, and studies and we get that data, we can really help to educate other doctors, which is important. Like you said, I think that's really key. Um, and also ed educate our legislators and our politicians about the safety or really any potential harm, because I don't like to say that anything is purely you know, safe and, and without risk. There's always going to be some concern and we should be responsible about those things. But how does research look? Because I, I love you know, the global concept of research collaboration and then 
build the markets, like you said, locally and then expand out into regional and then other market shares? I, I think, thank you for your question, Rob. Sure. And uh, I think that you, you just mentioned something that is important, which is collaborative research. Um, uh, within our team, we are glad to have Dr. Lorena de la Peña. Uh, she's a biochemist and, and um, she uh, lives out in, in Spain. And from, from that position, she coordinates several cooperative efforts that we are um, uh, sponsoring in order to have research with other entities. And uh, we already here in, in Peru, we already are discussing with uh, institutions from the public sector that are interested in, in, in taking research. Basically, the good thing is that uh, people that has already been you know, uh, uh, trained or learning a little bit on cannabis understand that uh, it's very positive that the safety uh, step of research can be approached differently because there's a lot of evidence of, of a low risk. So um, we have interest from the public sector on, on, on clinical trials. But I would say they are more observational. That's the approach that is happening so far. And the uh, second thing is that we are trying to also partner with institutions abroad in order to have some cooperative research. And uh, this, there's very positive interest in some institutions. Uh, I was talking yesterday with uh, one of the universities where we cooperate here. And even though the cooperation so far has been up to just training, so providing webinars and, and, and training uh, uh, material, uh, they're already requesting to go to the next step, with this, which is research. And they're both in the agronomical side of research and on the clinical side of research. So uh, I would expect that we should have some news of a specific projects around Q2 next year. And uh, as far as CanFarm stands for, uh, we will look to have that cooperative with other countries as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, the human trial aspect of it, whether it's observational through use um, or guided, um, obviously, you know, when you're dealing with disease states, um, that's a trickier uh, area when you're in that medical parameter. When you're talking about wellness, uh, optimization of health, functional medicine in that regard, I think there could be some opportunities where okay. that risk factor is not, you know, worrying about someone's, you know, having a terminal illness or something of that nature, but someone just to feel better or you know, I, you know, performance enhancing plants, you know. No, to totally agree. I think that there's a couple of things that are gonna, we're gonna need to change. I'm gonna have to be a little bit bold in order to, to propose new approaches. Uh, from, from, from our view of, uh, on health, we support a lot integrative medicines. We don't think that solutions are just come in one molecule. And, uh, and, and, and by that, I mean, the the concept of entourage effect on cannabis but the concept more wide concept that the health is a common thing i was sharing an article with my team last week about you know the the oriental forest bath concept that the fact that people go into the forest in order to be nurtured by the volatile compounds that are in nature and how can we use that experience to develop solutions that are more urban you know for people that are not close to forest but the other thing is that I think that um, we have to look for different ways to have uh, 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 drugs or treatments approved. So I think that we are going to be, we, we're going to witness in some time some new solutions, data-driven approach. Uh, uh, and uh, I think there's already solutions in, in, in process where platforms can help us to gather data from patients and doctors, and the amount of data will be enough to prove that there is something and, and, and we don't have to always follow, you know, the double blind placebo right. path. So I think that uh, cannabis and natural medicine will allow us to, to test a different approach to, to approve medicine. That's great. Thanks so much. That's awesome. Thank well you, Andres. We appreciate you coming on to Canna World Expo and sharing with us your insight from Peru. We mm -hmm. hope to have you on our broadcast again soon and thank you very Anytime. much thank you have a great rest of the day thank you too bye, -bye.